Hey there, how are y'all doing? So, episode two, Q&A, let's not waste any time, hop right into it. So our first question for today comes from Jackson Hughes, who asks, Apologies if this is a dumb question, as I'm rather new to Warhammer. How common is Dwarven in fighting? I've looked around your channel a fair bit and haven't heard of much, excluding the Chaos Wars, of course. Keep up the good work, by the way. So, I'm not 100% certain what this question means. Um, perhaps, the, the best thing I can draw from it is maybe Jackson's asking, how often do dwarves fight? Or, like, how how much does the average dwarf fight? Um, if, if you mean how often do they go to war, then the answer is a bunch. Um, dwarves are always marching out to reclaim lost territory, search for ancient treasures that have been lost, assist other holds that are under siege or need support, establishing new mines, or seeking vengeance for grudges, you know, taking out like a particular enemy, or wiping out a certain amount of greenskins or skaven to strike out a grudge in the Damas Kran. But, uh, tons of reasons. Um... That, that's kind of like the staple of Warhammer Fantasy is that all of the playable races, at least, are very, very warlike. They're warmongers. You know, they're all about going out and fighting constantly. That's kind of the... That, that's what makes Warhammer so fun and exciting is you don't have to worry about any peacetime <laughs> most of the time. It's just people constantly going at it. But um, if you mean how much of the dwarf population tend to fight on average, almost all of them... Um, women or Ren, as they're called, R I N N. Um, typically, they dwarves try and keep them away from fighting just because girl dwarves are very, very rare. Um, I think last episode we talked about like every two out of ten births, which is which is horrible. Um, for like continuing a species, um, that that's like that's a low enough birth percent ratio that if some serious problem happens, you could easily get wiped out. So, uh, but other than that, every dwarf is expected to know how to fight, how to, you know, how to lock into a shield wall or, and wield an axe or what have you. So hopefully that answers that question. If not, feel free to just, uh, Jackson, if you're there, feel free to just leave like a clarification question in the comments. And I'll get, I'll get to it. Our next question comes from poor manatee 6197, who says, do female dwarf slayers exist? Yes, actually. Um, but to say that they are rare is a gross understatement. It is a super gross understatement. To the Dawi, an oath is an oath. If you are an oath breaker or bear some incredible shame due to a failure, that will prevent you and maybe even your ancestors and descendants from finding entry into the Hall of Ancestors in the afterlife. The only option you have to escape that fate is by is to die in combat seeking a glorious death. Off the top of my head, I cannot think of any female slayers, but conceptually, there must have at least been a few. Um, granted, if a situation occurred where a Wren did take the Slayer's Oath, you better believe she would not be taking it alone. Losing a losing a Wren to Grimnir's cult would be devastating to her clan, any associated clan, any clan that was involved in whatever events led to that, and um, even to like the hold she was from. It would it would be a horrible horrible event. That being said, there's no reason one can't exist. Um, it, 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 it has to have happened at some point, but like I said, I can't bring anything to memory. Um, Philia Bong asks, I really like the splitting of the Q and A's makes it easier to watch them. Thanks. I appreciate that. I always question whether or not this was a good decision <laughs> and your questions for the Dawi. Okay. There are a few, uh, number one, how strong is Gromrel armor? Really? Could it like, could it protect you from a handgun, magical elf arrows, or even warp stone projectiles from Giselle's? Two, since dwarf rangers know the mountains very well, could they not easily help or take cutoffs by causing landslides or avalanches to attack fortified greenskins, which would then cause casualties the orcs and Skaven couldn't keep up with? 
And three, are there is there an aircraft carrier that has gyrocopters? Okay, so first question. Gromrel is unmatched by any natural metal found across the Warhammer world. Um, Gromrel is more often than not like it, it's almost it, it it is it is unbelievably fantastical in its elements. When properly forged into armor, it can easily thwart elven arrows, um, bullets from handguns. Uh, it can casually turn aside like a lance thrust from a charging Bretonian knight. And it can even hold back like a giant, you know, um, swinging at you. However, it's not invulnerable. Um, especially to weapons that were specifically crafted to tear through it. For instance, warp lock Gisales, which use unstable ammunition, aka warpstone bullets. Those warpstone bullets um, are... Warpstone is incredibly deadly. And Skaven have kind of perfected making armor-piercing rounds by using Warpstone bullets. And Gisales in particular can tear through Gromeril like paper. Like, they can just shred through it. Um, the only way that Gromeril can naturally survive against, like, Gisale fire is that you need to have um, runes on your shield. That's why, for instance, Belagar's shield, the Shield of Defiance, it can easily turn aside and block Warpstone bullets. Um, like, no problem. Um, he's even done that in stories. So, um, which is helped because Gromeril is also the best metal there is for runic crafting. Steel is very, very good for rune crafting, but Gromeril is like ace for rune crafting. But that should answer that question. Uh, the second one... Uh, which was uh, rangers, right? So that actually does happen a lot. Dwarf rangers do use different tactics to kill lots of enemies of the dwarves. They cause landslides or avalanches. Or one of their favorite tactics is they will purposely piss off a like an enemy and lure them into the territory of a manticore that will then descend on them and tear them up. Or sometimes they'll even like use special kinds of bait and distractions to lure a griffin um, off its hunting grounds into a marching army. So it will attack them and kill a bunch of people. Like they do that kind of stuff all the time. However, you have to remember that first of all, holds are not easy to do that to. Like, it, like, a dwarf ranger cannot just go to Black Crag and start doing stuff to the dwarves. You have to remember, Karak Eight Peaks is a hold where there's, like, an amphitheater in the center. You know, like a bunch of open space. And then there's ri a ring of mountains around it. Most holds aren't designed like that. Most holds have no exposed part to the air. They're all built into the mountain or underground. There's nothing you can... There's nothing rangers could really do besides like you know maybe cause a cave-in but even then if they do that that's a part of the hold that could likely be destroyed um and b that's only going to put a dent in those numbers i mean with dwarves we're talking about armies that are in the thousands of strong if they're lucky um but with skaven for instance we're talking about tens of thousands and with um greenskins kind of the same thing you know skaven skaven literally will throw a thousands of skaven slaves forward at the start of a fight just to trigger like the enemy's earliest responses like get them to fire their war machines or unleash fanatics if they're green skins and all this stuff and they'll just sit back and wait for the enemy to basically spend a lot of their ammunition trying to kill all the slaves then the actual skaven army will come forward and attack that's like a really classic skaven um tactic so there's there's so many of them so kind of the, the big reasons are that A, dwarf holds were designed to last for eternity. And there are not a lot of devastating environmental attacks that you could unleash upon the forces um, holding there, assuming you can even get in. Like Black Crag is very heavily defended um, just because the sheer volume of goblins and orcs that live there. Two, dwarves are loathe beyond loathe to destroy the priceless works of their ancestors you know because the dwarves are kind of a we'll get more into this in a later question but 
Dwarves are a species that they were capable of, like, mind-blowing feats in Elder Days, especially when the Ancestor Gods were around. And But over the, over the millennia, as their empire has crumbled and they've suffered devastation after devastation, they've lost a lot of amazing techniques and abilities that they used to have. Like, they can't replicate the work of their ancestors. So to destroy something like that is is sacrilege it is like an unforgivable sin like some people will take a slayer oath if they're forced into a situation where they have to destroy like a wall or a room or a statue or a carving that their ancestors made most dwarves are a little more practically minded than that in the modern day but it happens sometimes so they don't want to use tactics that would result in them destroying all of their amazing history and uh, um, design. They they would rather fight the long slog, you know, over the course of centuries, and try and force their opponents out with armies and um, you know stuff like that than they would blow up a hold and bury everything underneath and just say you know screw it, which is kind of a flaw of the dwarves, you know. Um, as to your third question, are there aircraft carriers? Uh, yes, actually. There are there are both flying vessels and naval vessels that are capable of carrying gyrocopters on board. Um, when it comes to flying vessels, um, the, uh, the first one that comes to mind is the Spirit of Grungni, which was built and constructed by uh, Malachi Mikeson. Um, he has, it's a, like a big zeppelin that is capable of having uh, gyrocopters on it. Um, that can, There's like a pad where they can hang out. And you can like take off and fly. Um, you can read about that in the Gotrek and Felix book uh, Dragon Slayer. Um, and then there's also ironclads that are colossal. You know, they're these big old, um, very, very heavily armored warships. And um, new tons of ironclads are capable of or have gyrocopter landing pads. Where they can, you know, where they keep gyrocopters on board that can go out and harass enemy ships and uh, such and such. So, like, the the game that introduced us to Count Noctilus and RNS Assault Spite as characters, which is known as, um, oh gosh, what is it called? Um, well, it, it doesn't, mm, it'll come to me at some point during this video, but um, it's, it's, a, it's an ocean warfare game, but, um, in that game, you could one of the ships you can play with is a dwarf ironclad that has like a bunch of gyrocopters that it can use to harass enemy ships. Um, so hopefully, uh, I don't think we'll ever see ironclads as playable in Total War Warhammer because that would require naval warfare. But I do really, really hope that we will get dwarf war zeppelins or, or um, sometimes they're called thunder barges um, as a DLC or free DLC update to the dwarfs. I really, really hope for that. Uh, Brody Knight asks, how often do dwarves get their beards damaged mid battle? And what is the consequence slash response? Their beards cover their whole torso quite often. So it seems like it should be very commonplace. Also, what should slayers do or what do slayers do if they're captured by force? Gotrek said a dwarf should kill themselves before they become a slave in elf slayer. But this, but isn't suicide a serious crime for slayers? So two questions, technically first question uh, pretty rare, actually. Dwarves are very protective of their beards, um, but their fighting stance is pretty good. Uh, a, dwarves tend to, um, when dwarf beards get really long, you know, once they become like an actual long beard, dwarves tend to weave their beards into like plates or like really elaborate patterns. And what they'll do as a part of that is they'll often put like pieces of like metal, like steel or grommel or silver or gold in their beard which acts as almost a sort of armor and sometimes even a weapon. I know of at least one story where a dwarf managed to kill someone by like flicking his beard and had like a steel spike on the bottom and it like cut somebody's throat. That has happened in a story. But um, uh, some dwarves go the extra mile and wear like full on beard guard uh, made of Gromero, like iron breakers. You know, they have those big masks where they have the whole beard and that's practical. It's there to defend their beards. Um, to make sure that they can't um, be torn apart. That being said, if a dwarf, uh, if a dwarf loses like a chunk of their beard or like a couple of noticeable hairs in a fight, it would just make the dwarf like 
super angry. Like, he's not going to, like, bust his, his own nuts over it. But you better believe he's going to do everything in his power to rip the spine out of whoever did that to him. Um, however, if a dwarf uh, loses their like loses their beard in battle because it's burned off, or they like they get scalped along their chin, or you know something happens to that extent, or it's like mangled beyond salvation, that is a deep and terrible shame to a dwarf. Their beards are incredibly important to their sense of honor and respect and culture. Um, a dwarf's beard is priceless. Uh, mo any dwarf would much rather lose one of their limbs than lose their beard. And if dwarves do lose their beard, that is instant Slayer Oath. Instant. Um, there, is, there is no dwarf who has remained sane of mind and not taken the Slayer Oath who lost their beard. No, there's that has not happened. <laughs> that is like that is like, ooh, that's bad. Um, but uh, like there may be a single or very minor exception, but ninety nine point infinite nines percent of the time, instant slayer them. As far as slayers are concerned, if a slayer is captured by force, that's that's a pretty serious shame to a slayer. But they're already slayers, so you can't like double up. But uh, it doesn't reflect badly on his oath as long as he doesn't die without honor so like if you were to die a slave because like you got crushed by a boulder you worked yourself to death as a slayer you're boned um like that's no good you might as well have killed yourself um slayer but a slayer it, it is totally within their oath if they got captured as a slave to patiently wait for a moment in which they can fight back and basically either fight against their captors or something, you know, some monster or whatever, and still achieve an honorable death. Being captured as a um, slave is not like a, not like a you should kill yourself moment for a slayer. Um, it's just a bide your time and then go for it moment as a slayer. When Gotrek said that, um, you're right that suicide is a huge no-no among slayers. Suicide is like not acceptable in dwarven culture at all. Um... When when Gotrek said that line that a dwarf should kill himself before he allow or before he becomes a slave, what what Gotrek was trying to communicate was that dwarves should never allow themselves to be taken as slaves. And in and granted, Gotrek is very conservative for a dwarf, but um, there are some dwarves that would not agree with him. They, there are some dwarves that think it's better to keep fighting and to survive than to just like kill yourself. Or, but when when Gotrek said that, he didn't mean like literally blow your own brains out. He more meant that you should fight with just your fingernails and your teeth if that's all you got left. And you should fight and fight and fight until you die um, rather than be in chains. Um, now, there are, there are dwarves that would disagree with Gotrek on that. During the War of Vengeance, um, the elves... Um, uh, I think it was uh, Tor... Oh, gosh. I'm um, drawing a blank on the name of the city. But um, the, the the main city of the War of Vengeance conflict was the... It was like a... was the capital of the elves in the old world. It was the like the main... Tor Elisor? Tor... Uh, Tor something. But uh, it was attacked multiple times by the dwarves. It was sieged a bunch of times before it was finally uh, taken or destroyed by the dwarves at the end of the War of Vengeance. And um, one of the things that played a key role in how, how the city fell was that the elves took captives when they would beat the dwarves. And they would use the dwarves as slave labor to build bigger and better walls and like rings of walls around the city for against future assaults but those dwarves were clever there were dwarves that like purposefully got caught and taken into slavery so that they could sabotage the elves construction which ended up playing a massive role in why the elves lost at the end of the war but um enough of that so brian fam asks how far are the dwarves in terms of technology where would their technology be in our human history? So, dwarf technology is kind of tricky. Because on one hand, 
they're super behind us because they're very conservative and a lot of their technology is like in this is like steam powered and stuff and then on other the other hand they have some technology that's like insane like the engineers guild created the drake guns which use like they basically use like a hardcore chemical reaction to basically just vomit out these bolts of molten fire to just ruin your day because unlike in total war warhammer iron drake gun or iron gun or uh, drake guns are not flamethrowers they they shoot out like bolts of um this like magma like these big old bullets of like molten hot metal that um will just 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 destroy your face um but they work really nicely as flamethrowers do but like that's not rune magic that's just like really clever engineering so i'd say overall they're probably like a really good distance if you had to compare our overall technology to theirs and our human history which granted my human history is not as nearly as good as my warhammer history knowledge um, I would say the dwarves are probably equivalent to like our late stage industrial revolution um, because dwarves have discovered the capability of flight, though they're fairly new at it. Uh, they have um, they have a lot of steam powered engines. They have fantasy versions of basically uh, they use oil and like, you know, they have like their dwarven fantasy equivalent of like gasoline and oil that they use to power a lot of machines and engines. Um and they do have, excuse me, they do have some marvelous machines that are, like, kind of, uh, mind-bending. Like, the, some of their steam engines and drills and stuff that work and that allow them to go to depths that we can't. <laughs> and other crazy stuff like that. So, hopefully that answers that question. I'm, I'm honestly not the best person to ask that. I'm sure there will be, I, that is one of those co questions I bet a ton of people will be more than happy to pitch their uh, opinion on in the comments so um uh, that could be like a good community question for this video is what what era of human history do you think the dwarves are equal to all right next up we've got master ej who asks what do dwarves believe awaits a slayer in the afterlife if they fail to find redemption by glorious death for example a slayer dies by tripping and rolling off of a cliff so to, if, if a slayer fails in his oath or a dwarf dies um, an honorless death and is like broken his oath and is an oath breaker, what awaits you is an endless wasteland full of nothing. The only thing that will await you is a is just a, a like a, a literally endless desert. Full of your failings and regrets that will haunt you for all eternity. Unless you somehow get redeemed by like a descendant. But to the Dawi, this is, is, is horrifying. Because not only will you personally be damned to this eternal hell. But in many cases, so will your ancestors and your descendants. Because you have to remember in dwarf culture... Um, if you commit a horrible crime and you die without um, being able to resolve it, it doesn't just die with you. It's passed on to your next of kin or someone else who can be held responsible. So that could be your kids. That could be your significant other. That could be your parents. That could be your cousin. Maybe your friend or an ally or your clan or your hold. Like, it could... There can be horrifying um, passings of severe sins. I mean, look at um, look at Ungrim, uh, Iron Fist. Ungrim, Iron Fist has never done anything that would require him to take the Slayer Oath, though he did take it um, voluntarily near the end of his life uh, for reasons involving his son. But. Uh, his entire family line was tainted by the Slayer Oath because none of his fathers died an honorable death in battle. All of them died fulfilling their oath of kingship. So according to that logic, uh, to dwarf religion, none of, Ungr none, none of the Slayer Kings of Karak Kadrin or their descendants have been able to go to the Hall of the Ancestors in the Afterlife. 
and none of them got to until Ungrim finally met. Well, Garagrim redeemed his family by dying in battle against a chaos giant. But Ungrim then took his own oath, but then he achieved um, a slayer's death against Archeon. So eventually they redeemed themselves, but to but to become a slayer is a dark and heavy commitment, not only to yourself but to everyone. It is it is to fail in the slayer oath is a really scary form of damnation. At least to me, like I really like my family and like the people in my life who are close to me, either by blood or bond. So like the idea that I could fail at something and or my sins could be passed on to them the instant i die that's a scary thought especially if i know for the fact there's an afterlife and i'm going to be punished forever and they're going to be punished and like there's going to be no comfort for anybody until somebody figures it out that's that's pretty it's pretty nasty so there's that uh next we have ea diaz who says, also, why don't you dwarf use spears in, in in lore? I understand from a style choice, but everything but everyone seems to say that dwarves should use spears. Okay, so uh, this I've heard this one too. There there are a lot of people who are like, oh dwarves, you know, <laughs> dwarves should use spears because physics and they it, it would be better because they're short, uh, even though a dwarf would clock them in the face for suggesting it. So the Dawi have a very ingrained sense in their culture that any weapon should function as a tool and those those have to go together the ancestor gods discovered and taught the dwarves to use uh axe hammer and pick which they have mastered over thousands and thousands of years um to innovate something completely new and absurd like a spear which is useless if you're mining, forging, um, or doing a lumber operation, rune crafting, farming. Like a spear is not a tool. It's explicitly a weapon. Or a walking stick if you're really desperate. Um, to innovate a weapon like that it would be an insult to the ancestors of your people. Because you have to remember, one of the things that dwarves are so stoic about or stubborn about is one of the thing, reasons they don't like innovation is because whenever you innovate in dwarven culture, you are basically making a declaration of what we had for this was not good enough, so we need to do it better. But when you do that, you are literally saying everything that came before us was bad <laughs> and that that's like a huge no-no in dwarf culture that's why being a dwarf engineer is so difficult because innovate you to be a dwarf engineer is very tricky because you want to innovate because that's what they're naturally gifted for and they're really good at you know they want to invent the organ gun and the cannon and the flame cannon but they have to do it in really tiny steps because they have to prove that it is better than what their ancestors had so uh but uh beyond that of course the dwarves the first time the dwarves encountered spears as like a weapon that was effective was when they met the elves and the dawe do not take kindly to anything at all that reminds them of those pointy-eared backstabbers they don't like the dwarves you will never meet a dwarf who likes the idea of using a bow or a spear, or a sword, or a, you know, they don't like any of that, because it literally, in their heads, they only see those as tools of war, but more importantly, they see them as useless as tools, you know, they might look okay, but to the dwarves, they're like, oh, these are flimsy weapons that can't even do anything outside of wartime, like, what's the point of them, and they look at them, and they say, plus, those algae use them. We're not going to use that garbage. We're better than them. We're going to use what our ancestors used. Um, finally, most of a dwarf's life will be spent fighting. Uh, will be spent fighting. And for those who do spend their time fighting, it will be underground. Um, a lot of dwarves participate in underground warfare. That's like a really just, it's just unavoidable fact. For the dark and tight corridors in which you're facing off against Skaven and Goblins, it's much better to have weapons that flourish in those close quarters 
over like cumbersome spears, which spears could use be used effectively in tight spaces, like goblins use them and Skaven use them because you're able to, you know, effectively just make a wall. But to dwarves, they're these flimsy weapons that dwarves the, the fighting style of dwarves is all about getting up really in your face, up close and personal, and making really effective use of their superior muscles and uh, stature. Um Especially to the dwarves, every time they've gone up against spears, spears intrinsically have done really shittily against dwarves. Because dwarves just run into spear walls and the spears just snap against their um, superior armor or shields or are easily turned aside by axes and hammers. Like, the dwarves just have massive disrespect for spears. They don't like them aesthetically or functionally. Um, and, you know, there's no such thing as mounted dwarves, so they also don't see the use of spears or lances. And, ultimately, dwarves are the living embodiment of a, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, kind of race. So, spears have just never been able to bridge that gap as useful in dwarven culture. I mean, you'll notice that for dwarves, they have not innovated on melee weapons in thousands of years. They've innovated on range weapons. You know, there were dwarves that figured out black powder and were like, oh, this lets us shoot further and with greater force and sometimes even better accuracy. You know, so they, but thunderers, uh, handguns, cannons, uh, organ guns, all that stuff are sp still kind of rare. Um, like, they're fairly widespread, but, like, I would say probably 30% of the dwarven population hates black powder weaponry and thinks that it's this newfangled nonsense, even though it's been around for, like, thousands of years at this point. Um, and then you have, like, even more dwarves who look at steam-powered weapons or fire-powered weapons, or, like, weapons that shoot fire, like flame cannons or, so, I guess, alchemical weapons. And they look at that and they're like, ah, oh, you know, we don't need that. That's garbage. We don't, that's, that's newfangled nonsense. It's unreliable. It has a chance to misfire. Like it can explode. Like this is, this is ridiculous. Like no dwarf should ever need to use that. And you know, a lot of dwarves, you'll meet dwarves that like are like, the only thing a dwarf should ever need is a crossbow, an ax and a shield. And like a suit of mail, because that's all my great, 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 great grandfather needed. And he fought orcs that were 10 times taller than the orc. Like that's, that's the way, like dwarves are the epitome of the grandfather. That's like, well, back in my day, you know, I walked to school barefoot, naked, uphill, both ways through eldritch dimensions in blizzards of negative 400 degrees. And I was fine. And he's, like, complaining because he has to pay the taxes for his kid to, like, take a safe bus to school so that they don't have to, like, walk in the heat. <laughs> you know, those those are dwarves. So, hopefully that kind of answers that question. And we are out of time. Uh, so, I will make a note of where we are for today. So, thank you to everyone who submitted questions. Hope you guys are enjoying the return of the series. We'll be back tomorrow with another 30 minutes of questions. See you guys then.